Welcome to the iTracks webinar. My name is Garnett Weber. I'm one of the co-founders of iTracks. Thank you for joining us for the webinar today, Making the Leap to Online and Mobile Qualitative Research Part 3, Engaging Participants. Kathy Fitzpatrick and Brent Beatty conducted a board on iTrack software with researchers discussing engagement of participants. They are now doing a presentation on the board, the experience, and the findings from the study that they conducted. Presenting today is Kathy Fitzpatrick. Kathy brings with her an impressive career in marketing research and extensive experience ranging from research design and field operations to client relationship management. She obtained a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and Physical Education from the Elmhurst College in Illinois. Kathy has over 30 years of experience in the marketing research industry where she has been a leader in both the research and the sales facets of the business. In her roles as director, consultant, vice president, she has over 13 market years market research field work, research and development experience, and over 17 years of experience building extraordinary client relations across many companies and industries. Kathy has a vast understanding of the research methodologies within both qualitative and quantitative using online technology and video-based research. Brent Beatty is also involved with the project, helped conduct it, and he will be answering questions today. Brent Beatty is a corporate account executive with iTrax, where he specializes in working with the iTrax clients to support their online and mobile research projects. He obtained a Bachelor of Commerce degree at the University of Saskatchewan, majoring in marketing in 2013. Prior to joining iTrax, Brent worked in sales and marketing in the telecommunications industry. Since joining iTracks over two years ago, Brent has successfully worked with numerous clients to help them understand and coordinate an online research mo online and mobile research projects. I commend both Kathy and Brent for their recent, recent qualitative project and look forward to the presentation of their findings. Thanks, Garnett. Hi, everyone. This is Kathy Fitzpatrick, um, working with Brent Beatty, as Garnett mentioned, to build out part three of our Making the Leap presentation and um, engagement with participants. The purpose of this project and this series is really to help our researchers understand how to use online qualitative and mobile, and when to use it, and how to make it extremely powerful. Before we start with the results today, for those of you who've not been to a, to a um, presentation by us at iTrax, I thought I'd give some background of the company, who we are, what we do. So the first thing we'll start with is that our headquarters are based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. So they're pulling from a pool of people up in Canada to help in the design and the development of our platform and technology. We also have project management staff up there um, along with developers and tech technicians to support the business and your projects. We are an independent and an innovative market research technology company. So if we focus on the technology first, we do have these incredibly powerful platforms. But I think what makes it important and um, of equal importance to all of you is that we are also innovative market researchers. So we've looked at our platforms, we've looked at our technology through the lens and the eyes of researchers which is part of how this whole series started. So that that's what we have done as a company. Now we are helping enabling researchers and end users brands to better understand what it's like to be immersed in the world of qualitative online research. We did develop the first version of an online focus group back in 2000. Scary thought, isn't it, to think that 16 years ago the first version of online focus groups was developed and we're still, from many perspectives, in the infancy or maybe graduating into the toddler years of how to use online qualitative research. 
We are an industry leader in mobile qualitative and advanced video-based research. You'll focus, and part of this project really focused on some of the video capabilities and how it can add to engagement and data insights. We do offer a full suite of qualitative platforms, um, including patented client viewing rooms. We won't go over all of the different technologies today, but if you'd like more information, we can certainly share it with you down the road. We regularly engage with users to feed the software innovation process. We actually have a process in place within the company as our clients say to us, gee, I wish I could do, or gee, I wish this had. And we have an actual form that we fill out and send to our developers. Our VP product development, um, Gilles Gautier, takes all of these and then makes a roadmap and a plan for where we're going to go next and what we're going to build on as it relates to the platforms. We do have many different types of ways that you can connect with participants, whether they're in the B2B or the B2C sector, using our software. They fall into really two different categories. The first would be longitudinal asynchronous data collection and resulting reporting. That would encompass our ITRAX board and our ITRAX community. Both of these platforms are longitudinal in nature. Boards typically run between three and five days. They can go longer, but that's a pretty good rule of thumb to think about. In our community environment, those are more longitudinal even than that. Those can run a month, six months, a year, but it's basically taking participants and asking them to answer questions, perhaps do a series of activities in an asynchronous manner, which means it's not happening real time, but more importantly to the design of the research happening in the real world. So rather than having researchers following people around in an ethnography or videotaping people in an in-store, you know, the behavior of people is much different when they're being driven, if you will, as opposed to being the driver. So they have their mobile device, they go out and record, and they do it in a pretty natural way. So those are some of the features and benefits of the two longitudinal asynchronous products that we have. The other three platforms are really geared to the real-time um, market research products um, and uh, like focus groups online. The first is our telephone IDI iTrax platform. It's really a software development and it was developed to for those researchers who still have the need to conduct qualitative research using the telephone and recording that, scheduling that, and then being able to connect people to a media share um, using the, um, the web so participants can actually see media that's being shared by the moderator there is a back room, so that back room virtually, if you will, where, part, where your um, clients and the end users, people that you work with can log in, can be dialed in and listen to the interview as it happens and communicate with the moderator to generate probing and thoughts back and forth. The second of our real-time products is the iTrax chat. Our iTrax chat was developed in order to allow participants to communicate in real time, so on a specific day, at a specific time, with a moderator and either one-on-one -on -one or a group of their peers that have been recruited to do a text-based uh, chat. So they're typically anywhere from 30 minutes up to two hours in length, and participants will be there real time interacting with one another and the moderator as the project is designed. The next is our, and the final product is our video chat. It is really the iTrex chat, but rather than having text, it is driven by webcam. The, part, the difference between the two, obviously, is the video component, but it's also a num of how many people you can have in each of these different platforms. If you're doing chat, which is the text driven, you can have um, anywhere between 12 and 18 people, depending upon your moderator, and have it be a very comfortable back and forth between everyone. If you're doing video chat, 
we recommend only six, maybe seven. And a lot of it is driven to the, the actual video component so that everyone has a really good experience. We don't want to have too many people or the video experience can be degraded a bit. And it's also to allow people to communicate with one another and not step over one another every time they're talking. So that's our basic offering of the different platforms and how we use them. Brent and I developed this study you're going to look at in the ITRAX board. It was open um, and we recruited people and I'll explain more about that shortly. Our goal was to work with researchers, end users, people involved in the market research community to make it easy for all parties to participate in both online and mobile qualitative research. From our part one and part two of this series, we found out that even though we as research as a platform and a technology company are pretty comfortable in the technology world of qualitative research, and you hear a lot about it, and you go to a lot of conferences and everybody's talking about it, the reality is probably less than 25% of our community as researchers really, really engage and use online research. And we figured and found out that it was true through the first two parts of this that people really want to do this, but they're a little bit gun shy. You know, they're not quite certain that they know how to do it, when they should do it, and how they should do it. So what we decided to do was actually build out some projects and have researchers end users, constituents of yours, actually be participants in the different types of research. So you kind of get that feel and you, and you get over the, the hesitancy because now you can experience what your participants experience. So I guess I kind of talked right through this slide, but <laughs> just kind of touch base. Um, we called it making the leap because I, we feel like the tech companies have done that. And as, if you look around you in the research communities, there are multiple new vendors out there, each one having sometimes a single offering, sometimes multiple offerings. But how do you compare those? We really kind of discussed that in part one. So if you want to go back, it's on our website. You can look at part one and part two and kind of catch up to where we're at now with part three. Um, some have new tools that they introduce over time. So the, the, the driving force here is it's not like research used to be. You have a methodology, you do it. In six months, you do the same methodology over and over and over again. What we might think about is a tracking study. But, you know, so our mindset is we did it this way, so we're going to do it that way again. Even now in online qualitative, six months from now, there could be multitude additional tools, even with your own vendors, and new capabilities within your vendors. So you, should, you need to always either be working with companies who will keep you updated on what they're changing and what they're adding, so that every time you can look at your research, look at your objectives, and build out the right design to get you to the right answers for your clients. Um, so that's what we did. We generated a longitudinal, longitudinal look at making the leap by then creating this four-part series of which we are in, part three. So this is kind of a real quick summary of what we, and where, what we did and where we're at. Part one was the iTracks board platform examining how people use online qual, what they use it for, um, what might be challenging for them, what went well, what didn't went well, kind of really dump, jumping in and letting our researchers and end users get in and be a participant. The next was an iTracks chat. The iTracks chat was set up so that each participant could experience the chat scenario. And how does that work? How do you have multiple people asking questions and being asked questions? We used some of the whiteboard media to show how you can make an engaging chat session without using webcams. Today we're doing part three, engaging the participants. So what are the ways to improve engagement from participants in online asynchronous research? 
Part three really was generated by what we found out in part one and part two. Almost everybody asked the question, so how do I take online research and A, get great insights? Equally important to that, how do I keep participants engaged? How do I keep the drop off from becoming so large, people coming in on day one and not finishing till the end, or if they do finish, I don't feel like I'm getting everything out of them that I need to. So we're going to come up with a couple of answers to those questions for you today. Finally, our last part of this series will be analyzing data collected using online methodologies. So I don't know that we've really decided how we're going to do this, but we'd really like for this to be more of an interactive session with actually showing you how to actually clip data from, from um, video, how you use filtering, how you create notes so that your um, reports are alive and really seeing the data to your end client. So the research objectives were to determine why these respondents lose interest in more generic types of activities, how we keep respondents engaged, and then what are some suggestions and tactics currently being used by the people who are participants who are either our clients or um, people who are in, interested in online research. So what have they done in the past to make it engaging? So let's talk a little bit about the overall methodology. Researchers were initially recruited using direct email and targeted social media invited to come in to participate in a five-day market research bulletin board. Um, they completed a screening survey, signed up for the online iTracks board, and because we use what we call an integrated approach, um, the participants were immediately pushed if they had qualified and wanted and agreed that they wanted to do this, they were pushed automatically into our bulletin board to what we call our landing page. On the landing page, they filled out a few questions and kind of got comfortable with the technology a little bit. And then the reminder to come back in a few days when the board would actually begin live for everyone. We segmented users, as we did in the past two parts, into three types. Moderators, researchers who were fairly new. That was a self-categorized um, designation. We also looked at the people who were experienced, again, self-identified. And then brand or end users who commissioned research were also in, asked to, come, to be included. Um, as I mentioned, we did use our iTrax board bulletin board. It was designed to showcase some of the techniques and question types um, to engage participants as well as dive into deeper responses. Not all of the techniques were used because otherwise the board would last for days and days. And we also, there is that point of, you know, you can have a lot of really good exercises, but you still have to be mindful of the time that you're requesting a participant to, to engage with you. So we kind of balanced the two and talked about some of it and actually did some of it. In order to be a successful board, we actually had to pick a topic because we wanted people to do very specific activities during the course of this board. So our participants were discussing their habits surrounding snacking, in particular, healthy snacking. They completed a variety of activities. We left the board open for five days. There was probably maybe really three days of activities, but we wanted to make sure people had enough time to complete everything we asked them to do. The first thing we start with, as it relates to how to keep people engaged, it starts with the moderator. Clearly, the moderator needs to write a really structured guide, but they can include some really fun ways to keep people engaged. The first way to, use, to do this is to use video to record your questions particularly the introduction. Hi, my name is Kathy. I'm going to be your moderator for this bulletin board experience. I'd love to know a little bit more about you. You might even say things like, you know, I've been in research for all these many years and um, I live in Illinois and 
my favorite hobbies are X and such. So getting them to know you, it's interesting. When people see another person on camera, there's that level of attachment. A, they know there's a real person conducting the research. B, they know what that person looks like, and they start to feel like they know that person. So even if you don't use video throughout, when you do ask a question, they're connecting with you as they envisioned you from the beginning when you did use your webcam. So meeting that moderator, quote unquote, in person, does give you a connection that goes beyond a typical text-driven welcome. Um, so just keep that in mind. I think it was interesting for us to hear while we were doing the board that moderators uh, at every level were like, oh, I don't know that I thought of ever doing that. Or if they did, they were a little bit, I don't know if I want to you know, film myself in, online. So you need to get over that little bit of fear you may have and jump in and just be part of the qualitative video explosion. And here we are. Now we thought this was funny when Brent and I pulled this together. If you notice, here I am, my mouth is wide open, and here's that little goldfish with that same mouth wide open. So we kind of giggled as we were building this. But let's take a listen to moderator engagement. I will be moderating this forum, so you'll see me in here every now and then asking questions and following up. In addition, as we learn more about best practices, and ways to create an engaging discussion guide, we've selected a topic to drive the discussion. By enabling an actual topic or theme, each of you will be able to travel the road of your participants. The purpose is to continue the discussion surrounding making the leap to online and mobile qualitative research. So here I am in my local produce section. There's some things that I look at first which might be pre-packaged. I don't typically buy these things because they're a lot more money, but certainly I would consider using some of these things for quick snacks or in place of a lunch. There's a lot of really good options here, so these would be some of the things I might consider. So these are two examples of how a moderator might engage participants. The first was actually just a snippet of what I said when people kind of logged in to get to start out on the board. The second was when we were asking people to go out shopping. So I lit up a little video and said, here I am in my local grocery store and here's what I might look for. So in this case, I did it very openly because I was really engaging with other researchers and the purpose of this was to show you how to do this and you know how fun it is to do. When you're in a real world bulletin board, you want to be a little more careful. You might shoot the video in front of your grocery store because as we all know, we don't want to lead participants to showing us exactly what we showed them. We want them to go in and do their own thing. So, we didn't pay that much attention to that, but just as, so that you're aware as you go forward and kind of begin to employ some of these tactics. The second thing we did was we looked at a very unique way of building out your incentive structure. This works with short-term bulletin boards. It's particularly useful with longer um, engagements, you know, anywhere between a week and further out, but you pay your participants a certain base rate for participating in your board. Then you can use what we built out, which is an automated leaderboard, where people were able to check their standings on a daily basis. It's auto-populated, so you don't have to go in and create this major Excel spreadsheet and be working on that. It really does just happen automatically, um, and it is being used to supplement and kind of create a little bit of competition within your participants. They get points based to the number of meaningful posts that they generate, responses to one another. So if they respond to another person's posting, um, finish assignments, engage with others, more points were gained for leaderboard status. In this particular engagement, we gave a top prize of 
pizza party for up to 10 colleagues delivered to your office, compliments of iTrack up to a value of $100. And then second through fourth got $25 iTunes, Apple in parens because we are talking healthy snacking here. So it was our little play on words, but gift cards. We kind of changed that up at the end because we had two people who were really, really engaged. And so we felt that we needed to switch up the incentive a tiny little bit. But yet, so we, we'll we see on the next page our winners are announced. Um, the response types and their associated points. A text response, at least five words, get them 10 points. If they built out an avatar, it gave them 25 points. If they responded to poll questions, they got 10 points. A picture response is 25 points, and a video response was 50. All of this is tailored to your design and your client and your participants. But it does serve to create a little bit of competition. And as the moderator, you can go in and out and encourage people. And believe you me, they do look. So this is our leaderboard. I'm not going to, we didn't put the whole thing in here. But as you can see, we had two really good good respondents who really did a good job of participating for the entire time. Everybody here completed, but some were much better than others. So even as researchers, we can take a step back and say, okay, maybe I could have done a little bit better job participating. But the point of this was really to expose you to what can be done to engage participants as opposed to really doing it all and being the leader. But anyway, Mary was our winner, so at 590 points, she would be and her team would be getting the pizza party. Carol and M.O., we decided to, to create a second place here, and her and her team will get a $50 um, gift certificate or whatever for a pizza party. And then we have our top three underneath that, 275 for Deanna, 265 for Chris Rowe, and 240 for Brent SC. Each one of those people will be receiving a $25 Apple gift iTunes card. So this is a way that you can keep your participants engaged to have them come back. So the more you make reference of this, it really works well, and people really enjoy doing it. The next thing I want to show you is some participant statistics. I, I threw this in here because I really wanted to show you that even as researchers, who we all agreed that we were going to be on board with this and we were going to take the four or five days necessary and complete everything and we were going to be the best little participants possible, the reality is life happens. And so just like your participants, some of you um, and some of our participants were more active than others. So of the 90 people who actually said they would participate in this group, in the sessions for the board, 62 actually did the whole um, board, which is a pretty good ratio. But it does show you that there were, what, almost 30 people who said they would do it but didn't, or maybe did one or two exercises. So it kind of gives you an idea of how much you need to over-recruit. Even when you're building out the best possible research project, they don't know what a best possible research project is until they get in and start having fun doing it. So I just wanted to include that. This is part of what you can use and see in the report section on our um, projects. The next thing we did, so let's summarize real quick here. We did the moderator engagement by videotaping and building a guide that is really a strong guide and asks people to do fun things. Um, we also use the incentive leaderboard. And now we use a methodology that, um, a tool that we have called iMarket. Each person was asked to evaluate a concept using iMarket. The beauty of iMarket is by using emoticon tools, you can leave feedback on the image. And you can tell us by using those emoticons what you like and what you don't like. The more important part of it is you can also see the why. So after you leave your mark, well, I like it, I didn't like it, whatever it is, a little um, dialog box will pop up and participants are required to put in why they said that. So here's a picture of a beach. I like I liked it. The box pops up. Why did I like it? I love the beach. I feel so relaxed there. So whatever you would use, it's geared to what your concept is, um, and it can also be used for 
statement and video as well. Deliverables from a concept iMarket would be word counts, a word document of all the statements, and a heat map. All content then created by using the iMarket can be analyzed using filters created by the research team. So this is the, uh, the iMarket we used. It was a concept. And we just kind of created some fun and interesting snacks that we pulled into one document. We asked people to show us what they liked and what they didn't like. So this is the, the heat map <clears throat> of their favorites. So clearly you can see mixed nuts was a favorite. Apples, veggies, and dip and cheese really kind of made the top three, I believe. Then you can see on the next slide we have the ones that were disliked or not really something they would consider often for a healthy snack because maybe they don't think it's healthy or they just didn't like it. But the big deal, ice cream. I think the sugar content here took ice cream out of the mix. Celery. And then I think it might have been a tie between oranges and popcorn. But once again, in the context of the board, we could then filter this by region. We could also look at the comments that might have been left. For the purposes of our presentation today, we didn't include all of those slides. The next thing we did was use video and pictures. So participants were asked to download the mobile onto their mobile device our app and use that app to complete activities during the course of the project. It included taking pictures and videos of their pantries, refrigerators, and snack preparation. Using video activities to see and share those experiences allows for you as the researcher to see parts of the answers that participants, you know, they might not talk about it, but it's what they're doing that you glean as a researcher that can help drive results even further. I think it works even better. The more video you collect, the more comfortable people are, the more insights you're going to see behaviorally. Often, as we've all said before, it's what they do that give insights rather than what they say. So let's start by looking at some in-home pictures and videos. Remember, this was in-home, in-pantry, in-refrigerator, and I think I might have one in here with snack preparation, albeit an easy one. Oops, hang on. Okay, so wanted a video response to where we keep the snacks. So this drawer is a common drawer where we keep some whole fruit. So that would be a common snack in the fridge. Cabinets here uh, again. Um, hmm, what snacks? We got some pretzels down there, some chips, kind of down there, scattered around the food. Uh, granola bars, Nature Valley bars, that sort of thing. Use a lot of cereal. Uh, as I said earlier, we're not heavy snackers. Uh, the other thing that we would have was a bunch of fruit. Now, my college son just came home, so uh, there's a lot more stuff here. He's accounted for the grapes. Cherries were ours. He brought home a pie. And you can see a couple of fruits and bananas, and there's some cakes there. Those two cakes and those containers, again, somehow miraculously appeared once my son returned. supposed to be about preparing a snack. May seem like cheating, but this is typically what would go on here. So if you're looking for a snack, grab a piece of whole fruit and get a knife and cut that up. And maybe if you want to make it a little more decadent, you could add like a caramel dip or something like that. But typically, just eat the whole piece of fruit. Call it a snack. So those are some examples of data that we collected. Again, this is very topical. Um, we wanted to just share and show how much fun it can be to actually get to know your participants a little better as well. The next thing we did were some, I think these are the pictures. So this is a picture of someone's refrigerator, a picture of their pantry, and then on the far right you can see this is one of the snacks that they were going to prepare with, with um, candied pecans and raw honey. Although that seems like a lot of pretty high sugar content, but healthy nonetheless because it has those those nuts there. So the next thing we did was the shopping excursion. You saw mine as a um, reminder to people, here's what we're looking for you to do. But if you include a shopping activity, to get that in the moment feedback without a researcher over someone's shoulder, um, getting it from the participants in their 
moment in time when they're going to go shopping and what they're going to buy as it relates to healthy snacking. So watching this on the in-store journey helps you to understand that thought process while they're in store. So the more directions you can give to the participant, the more they will share. In this case, we just wanted to see where they go in store to buy healthy snacks for their families. Here's some healthy snacks, cut up fruit. Uh, the reason we like these is, yeah, they're more expensive, but they're with barrier fruit is just the work needed to kind of get them ready. So we use them, we eat them, we like them, they're good for us, and for us it's worth the premium. We do applesauce with some cinnamon on it. It's a good, uh, cheap, uh, somewhat healthy snack. So as you can see, um, people shared with us their in-store shopping experiences in order for us to better understand where they go and what they do and when they're in the store. The next thing we did was ask our researchers who were participating what things they might do to go deeper. How are they more engaging? How are they creating guides and designs that really keep their participants engaged? I will say that it was one of the experiences on the board that I thought I would get a lot more than we did. And I think it might come back to the fact that there's just not a really good comfort level with all researchers in how to design and keep people engaged because that's what came up over and over again in parts one and two. There are, I'm sure, a bunch of moderators out there and researchers who have this nailed. We'd certainly love to hear from you, but from the perspective of who we engage, the 60-odd people, um, we didn't get a whole lot. And so I was a little surprised, but let me show you what we did get. Uh, and I think what we did get was extraordinarily insightful and back to basics. So as Garnett pointed out earlier, having my 30-plus years making me really old or really wise, um, I think it does go back to basics sometimes. You know, you can use online qual. You can engage your participants, but it's all about the structure of that guide. And most importantly, let's look at one of the, a couple of these statements. I thought it was impactful, respecting the intelligence of a respondent. And as we're taught from early on in research, probe, probe some more, probe some more. So the engagement of the moderator in the board, just because you're doing a longitudinal online project doesn't mean that you can check the box and excuse yourself from the research. You really have to know to engage participants, you need to be an engaged moderator. And it does take some time, but the result and the end result is well worth it. Another suggestion that we got was the researcher, a couple of people commented on this. I kind of collapsed it into one statement here. But using top three words to describe a content, a concept, or feeling that gives me the opportunity to create a word cloud in the final report to clearly illustrate the group's feelings is a really good way for the moderator to be engaged. I think if used in a guide and you had um, them complete, here's my three words, and then have everybody else's three words, and then have the group participate and kind of interact a little bit, would make it even more engaging. Perhaps that's what this researcher does. And as we've heard everywhere, using collage tools to give respondents opportunities to share their emotions and feelings using images. Um, you can use this by people pulling content from, the video, from their um, computers as they create collages and use whiteboards to that, to that effort. And then following, so as you can see, let me go back. Well, it's not a lot here, so I didn't leave a whole lot out. So I think what we need to realize as researchers is that maybe we need to do more of this collaboration and share our thoughts and ideas with one another so that the participants and our end clients are getting the best of what can be done, which in my opinion is extraordinary, in the online world. Methodology results, we just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what could come as a result of a bulletin board. You'd have your transcript. All of the videos that we had can be clipped and edited 
And as you saw, I built those highlight reels, easy to do and certainly impactful in a presentation. In conclusion, overall, the tools and question activity creation appear to be well received by all participants. So we got comments, you know, stepping outside of the participant role. Researchers would say, I loved doing this. I can't, I can't wait to do this with my next um, bulletin board, et cetera. The leaderboard was a hit with just about everybody. You know, being able to creatively use that and build out excitement um, is a lot of fun to do. It's a lot of fun for the moderator to use as a um, prod to keep people moving. Hey, you're, you know, you're number two, just a couple more statements. You might be number one. Um, again, you know, you're, you're generating content. You want to generate the right content. So how you build those pros out is important. Moderators' use of webcams for sharing the guide and kind of connecting with people seemed to be an easy fix in my mind and as it relates to how can we be engaging. But time after time, researchers, moderators, even end users were like, God, I wish I would have thought of that. It's, it's like so obvious, it's disregarded. Um, so I think that it's a really good way to do it. And I think that you'll find, um, I had one moderator one time who it was all about shoveling snow. So he filmed a lot of his questions outside in front of this garage, standing in front of a snow below, standing in front of a shovel. Um, it was cute and participants loved it. And then activities using things like iMarket give participants a fun exercise. The, the video iMarket is pretty fun to do as well. But all of these things can be generating an engaging guide and an engaging, engaged participant. Using the activities that require people to share in home and in store can add insights beyond what people say. So when you have an engaged participant, you're going to get more out of your data. That's quite obvious. So looking at behavioral research is pretty um, powerful, and you can do that by engaging participants enough for them to share in home and in store behavior. The researchers who participated in the bulletin board had lots of comments about God, this was such a great experience for me to be able to walk in my participants' shoes. I didn't realize they had to go through this, or I, I didn't realize that this was an important part. Now I see what you mean when you're talking about being more pointed. I will say that, you know, even in our guide, as experienced researchers in the, um, web and, in the bulletin board and digital online world, there were places we could have done a better job as well. So having those experiences really helps everybody. And as I said earlier, the great suggestions as ways to additionally create engagement, collages, word clouds, using whiteboard images and video, old the true, probe, 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 and the more active the moderator, the more engaged the participant. Any questions? I would like to say one more thing. I would like to thank the 60 people who actually participated in our bulletin board. You were all engaged. You offered great information. Most of you participated from beginning to end, and it was a pleasure having you on our board. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, we are going to move into the question and answer session now. You'll notice a chat area at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. You can enter your questions into the chat area and uh, we can discuss them from there. All right, uh, we do have a question to get us started here. Uh, so, um, and also, just a second here, I'm just going to make sure that uh, Brent is able to uh, discuss questions as well. Um, great. So, uh, first question here, to what extent do the incentives impact the engagement of participants and perhaps the degree of incentive? Uh, recognizing in this project uh, there wasn't a direct payment for all of the participants. Hey Garnet, thank you. I can uh, kind of address that question here for you as well. Thanks for your question today too. Um, I think incentives play uh, a very, very large part um, in increasing engagement for participants as well. And I think, um, 
you know, our webinar or kind of making the LEAP series board here was a bit of a special case because it was designed to help researchers see those different ways to engage participants and try to increase participation within the board. Um, so there was a lot of benefit um, to these individual researchers that logged in. So, you know, a lack of incentive here, um, you know, may be seen as something that would disengage participants, but I think people within our board would have been engaged just because they saw benefit for themselves, you know, in going through the questions and seeing what's available within the board. Um, and seeing those different ways to engage participants. But I do definitely think that incentives play, you know, maybe one of the, the largest roles um, in all those different pieces that we talked about today. Um, Kathy mentioned the leaderboard and a few different ways that we can set that up, you know, in terms of paying out incentives, uh, which can be customized um, quite in depth depending on the length of your study. And uh, I think really that incentive piece is probably, um, like I mentioned, one of the most important pieces um, in engaging participants, just because um, for a lot of people participating in the research, that's kind of the the big draw for them, or you know, the benefit that they see for themselves is getting that honoraria at the end of the study too. So definitely a large piece, um, and I think that does a, a very good job of getting participants in the door. But like we mentioned here, some of these different question types that are a bit more engaging or exciting um, can really help, you know, boost participation rates over time and keep people engaged and keep them within the board and participating, providing those quality responses more longitudinally as well. Great. Thanks, Brent. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, feel free to enter your questions at the bottom of the GoToWebinar uh, panel in the chat area. Uh, next question, very interesting one. Uh, do you think using online qual is as robust, accurate, and ethical as in-person interviews, specifically ethnographies? Yeah, very interesting question here too. And Garnet, maybe you have some points to add here as well. But um, if you could repeat the question back to me, I think there were three points. I heard um, them mention ethics. There was something about um, robust in terms of capabilities, and there was one more point Accuracy. as well. Accuracy, yeah. Accuracy. Yeah, you know what? I do definitely think that there are applications for both methodologies, right? So there are some studies, um, you know, specifically with ethnographic work, where um, an in-person methodology may be best. But I think there are definite applications um, for the online methodology as well. In terms of the amount of robust data that you can collect um, and accuracy, you know, I think there are points that could be made for both sides, but I'll kind of be the advocate for, for online research here. Um, in terms of robust capabilities, I think there is um, a ton that you can do online, specifically uh, regarding ethnographies, using our mobile application as well. Um, some of our researchers would argue that, you know, doing um, ethnographies that are led by the participant, letting them use the mobile app and capture some of that information, you know, in real time, in the moment, um, and kind of led by themselves may be more accurate because they're less likely to, you know, put on a show or act in a different way um, because they're alone and, you know, completing the activity in the comfort of their own home or, or without a, a team of researchers there watching them as it's being completed. Um, in terms of robust capabilities, um, I think that as Kathy mentioned, as we're making the leap over time and, you know, a lot of people are moving to online, we're seeing um, a ton of different ways to employ some of those methodologies that we may, you know, have found to be tried and true in person over the years um, and moving them more into an online space and making them more feasible. Having a more robust set of capabilities um, in an online environment, like some of the things that we've highlighted here today uh, in that Making the Leap webinar, uh, may not have existed five years ago or ten years ago when online qual was a, a bit more... Um, infant, um, but, you know, those capabilities have been added over time. So I, I think the suite of tools for online researchers and for online qualitative, even relating to ethnographies, um, is quite robust at the moment, but growing every day. Uh, and you'll see a, a lot more applications, you know, from software developers like iTrax and many other companies that will let you take those different methodologies online. Um, and those will get more robust as we go into the future. Great. Thanks, Brent. Uh, I will make a few comments in this area as well. Uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, share a case study. It's actually available on iTrack's website uh, under resources case study. And uh, this was an interesting project uh, done with one of our clients, Kinemedica. And it was a medical-based uh, study where uh, they were uh, uh, looking at devices and uh, with patients and um, nurse practitioner educators and uh, there is um, there was uh, very very positive feedback it was an ethnography study 
and uh, the, I'll just um, highlight a piece of the, of the client feedback from uh, Rebecca Carney here. Uh, the client got to observe the results in real time and they asked additional questions throughout the course of the study, either to groups or individuals. It wasn't just voice of the customer, it was non-intrusive ethnography collected from dozens of geographically dispersed uh, participants in three days. Uh, so again, the non-intrusiveness that uh, Brent commented on, I think that can be uh, really important. The other piece that the mobile devices and the mobile uh, ethnography uh, methodologies really offer is the uh, the timing of the research. Uh, we did have a client that was looking at uh, um, an appliance that was used primarily for preparation of breakfast, especially on the weekends. And when a traditional ethnography study is done, uh, in the logistics of coordinating uh, that done in the home was uh, difficult and could only be done during weekdays um, at uh, not when the family was preparing breakfast. And so so the, uh, the mobile app really provided a lot of uh, benefit in that uh, it could be done um, when in the environment that the client was using it uh, with the uh, children there and um, uh, in, they didn't sort of pre-clean and get everything ready uh, for the ethnographer uh, researcher to come into the home. And so for that particular study, it was, um, it was likely more accurate uh, than some of the prior methods and that they uh, were able to have it in a, you know, regular realistic environment. The other, um, the other comment would be on accuracy. Sometimes if you're relying on people to recall situations, uh, some of the human memory isn't always 100% accurate, and so having it uh, immediately after the experience, uh, which is a little bit easier with um, uh, using a mobile device, that can help with the accuracy as well. Okay, so moving on uh, to the next question here. More of a suggestion, but doing videos at a store is a little awkward, as you have many eyes on you from store employees to other customers. I think taking an actual video at the store is not as good, uh, is not a good practice. Any comments or feedback on, uh, on that, Brent? Sorry, Garnett, I was having a bit of trouble hearing that. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. Uh, so it's, um, uh, they're asking about uh, taking videos in stores and uh, the impact of store employees and other customers watching and uh, whether that's a good practice. Yeah, you know, I've kind of heard um, some comments from both ends of the spectrum here as well, and I think it depends on the type of activity you're asking participants to complete in-store. Um, and even the type of store environment that you're asking them to go into. So if we look back at Kathy's video, and I think from what I could see, she walked into her local Walmart and snapped a quick video. Um, and I think in settings that are maybe a bit more public or, or less private, you know, that type of activity can work very well. But if we're asking people to go into, say, a clothing store with one or two employees, it may be a little more awkward, not only for the participant, but for the staff that are working in the store too. Um, but there are different ways to tailor those activities to the, um, you know, the area that we're asking participants to visit to. You know, maybe an activity like snapping a quick picture or, you know, describing the, um, the interior or the experience via text uh, may be a bit more appropriate for that setting as well. But I think we just need to take a, a little time to kind of tailor our approach to, um, you know, the certain demographic that may be out taking the video and then the certain environment that we're asking those participants to go into as well. Mm -hmm. I'll make another comment there as well. Uh, there have been studies where uh, when a particular store wants research done, um, they can a letter can be sent uh, to the participants that they can then bring to the store. And if a uh, store employee or if someone were to question them, they would have that letter explaining um, uh, the scenario. And especially in a smaller, more private uh, environment that Brent mentioned, that might be a um, a more appropriate way to, to go about it. Um, we are finding that uh, just with the proliferation of, uh, of mobile devices, people are shopping, um, they're using mobile devices to locate coupons and to uh, price compare and things like that. So it is getting more common for people to be using, using their mobile devices while shopping, which does make it a little bit more natural. But uh, yes, recognizing it can be awkward, especially uh, speaking and, um, and shooting video of numerous areas. All right, uh, how, uh, next question here. 
How do uh, managing probes, given that you are responding to videos and responses after the time has passed, how do you manage the probes? Are there pros and cons or unique differences we should be aware of? Yeah, I don't know if there are a ton of unique differences in my mind that I can call out as well. So obviously just given the methodology of asynchronous research, you know, our moderator may not always be logged in um, at the exact time that participants are completing those activities. So we do want to get some feedback and some information um, in the moment, you know, while participants are in store and we'll rely on them to kind of, you know, provide a quality response and give us all the information that we've asked of them uh, right away. But again, you do have the ability to, uh, to follow up and probe for more information once that activity has been completed. Um, I will mention as well, you know, because of some pieces of our technology, the moderator can get some notifications uh, on the mobile app on their phone even when participants are out in the store. Um, you know, completing those activities and submitting video responses and text and picture responses in the store. Um, so we have had moderators in the past, you know, even answering those activities or kind of responding to them or probing for more information right away um, as participants still have that information fresh in their mind um, even within the hour just because they've been getting those notifications via their mobile app that participants are out completing the activity too. Super. Thanks, Brent. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we are uh, getting to the end of our time here. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending. It's been uh, great having the engaging discussion, and uh, we especially want to uh, extend a huge thank you to all of the researchers that participated in the board. It was uh, very valuable for us and for, uh, for the research community and just learning more about the topic of engagement. Uh, I will uh, mention uh, we do have some resources on the iTrax website um, that, uh, uh, that will uh, help support this as well as other areas. I wanted to mention one in particular. It's a great uh, webinar from the past that uh, Liz Van Patten with Van, Van Patten Research uh, presented, uh, Shifting Discussion Boards into High Gear, and that's a great, some great suggestions for, um, uh, for just excellent moderation uh, during uh, online bulletin board focus groups. Uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we will send up a follow-up email and a link to the recording of the webinar. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us and have a great day.